please welcome me, uh, help join me in uh, congratulating Anne, because just yesterday she received uh, excellent news that she's been awarded the gold medal of the International Academy of Pathology. They cited her dedication to AIP over the past decades, specifically her personal involvement in academic and service development in underserved pathology communities. She will be receiving this uh, in March. And you're welcome. Thank you, Sam. Can everybody hear me? Um, okay. I, one correction, I work at the Joint Pathology Center. I do network, but it, that's not the name of the facility. So um, down arrow here, which uh, it says there, it's over in Silver Spring. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about an overview of what pathology capacity actually is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this was a session that was um, put together for the International Academy of Pathology meeting in Cape Town. Uh, just some background history, the IAP is was founded in 1906 as the International Association of Medical Museums. Um, the former uh, Army Pathology Center, which was also the Surgeon General's Library, and a lot of things came out of what um, eventually became the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Uh, it was, the IEP was started with, by the AFIP and by um, McGill University, and one of the founding fathers was actually William Osler. And most people know him as a great internist, but he was a great internist because he started his career as a pathologist. So anyhow, um, the IAP now has uh, let's see, I wrote this down so I remember. There are 42 active um, divisions of the IAP, and um, it serves over 120 kind of member countries around the world. In October of this year, for the very first time, the International Congress was held on the continent of Africa. And through the efforts of a lot of people, they were actually um, able to get bursaries so that 321 African pathologists from 221 sub-Saharan African countries attended the meetings. Um, that represented over 50% of the pathologists in Africa who were able to come. And as part of that, we had a one-day seminar on the regional overview of capacity sort of identifying what are the problems and where do we go from here. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, a group of us, oops, wrong, wrong arrow, um, have been trying to figure out what is capacity, how many pathologists are there in Africa, what kind of infrastructure do they have. So um, Tim Rebick, as well as a few of us, Pooled of, and Ioric people pooled all our email addresses and sent out over 200 emails to pathologists around Africa and um, sent them a survey in French, Spanish, as well as English. Um, and we collected data. This is just data collected from um, <coughs> WHO and other places for information on health workforces available. And you can see from this map that all but a few countries in Africa, there is one or less pathologist per million people in the country, um, which compares to the U.S. with one per 20,000 or the U.K. one per 15,000. So it is one of the most underserved um, areas of medicine on the continent. I'll figure this out in a minute. Okay, and this is a chart that if you have the PowerPoint, you'll get. But what you can see here is there are actually one, two, three countries that have no pathologists at all. South Africa obviously has a lot of pathologists, and we'll go by region about what the coverage is. The best coverage is actually in Botswana, but that's because they have the smallest population. But it's um, evident that 
the population as a whole is not served, only those who have access to university or have money to pay private practice pathology. So the majority of the population in Africa does not have access to diagnostic pathology. So this is a little bit about um, why we did the survey. There's a lot of countries out there. They're all very different. Um, we don't know who even has fully operational laboratories with pathologists. So we did this survey to try to find out what was going on. Um, and this is what we got of the 200 emails sent out. We had 38 responses, but some of those were I think there were about 10 additional ones that were duplications of um, the same, like McCary had four people who filled out the survey, so we counted that as one response, not as four responses. And this is the uh, rundown of the countries that responded. Um, Kim Rebick has this database, so if anybody's interested in working with us and looking at some of these things, we're happy to share that information. So. What we did in Cape Town was ask each of the presidents of the three African divisions, West Africa or the four, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, and Francophone Africa. And these next few slides were developed by Dr. Iliasa, who is the president of the IEP in West Africa. And you can see the countries there that are members of that division. Um, we had two responses from Ghana, one from both from academic medical centers, one in the capital and one out in um, Kumasi. And they're both government-funded hospitals. In Nigeria, we had eight responses, although there's more than um, 50 pathology departments. Uh, six are academic, two were non-academic, but both were government-funded. We had no response from Liberia, Sierra Leone, or the Gambia, but uh, the Gambia has no pathologist. Most of it is sent out in Liberia and Sierra Leone because of their political situation are just now redeveloping uh, pathology capacity. They have a few um, people who have come back to help develop pathology services in those departments, people who had um, gone to the UK and other countries. So we summarized some of the workforce data. Um, Ghana has more than 14. They actually have more than 20 altogether. In um, the main hospital, Korlebu, there's actually more than 10 pathologists. And um, four in Kumasi, they have four cytotechnologists covering both those hospitals together, six histotechnologists. And I think the one um, important Subspecialty for people at NCI is oncologists, and there are fewer oncologists than there are pathologists in most African countries. But the bigger medical centers now mostly have chemotherapy and radiation therapy available. Much more limited than we have, but that is becoming available, so it is becoming possible to treat cancer. Um, what we as pathologists want to make sure is that the treatment is based on a tissue diagnosis and not on a presumptive clinical diagnosis. Um, Nigeria, you can see they have 158 total pathologists. Um, the cytotechnology, they didn't really have, they didn't put in information, so I don't know. It's not very many. It's probably three to four per hospital at the most in the biggest centers. Again, they listed four oncologists working at these um, these uh, four hospitals that, or six hospitals that responded from Uganda. And the uh, main challenges that were identified by the members of the West African Division, and I think this is true across almost all the divisions, is there's an important manpower shortage, infrastructure is not adequate, and there's not enough training, service, or research being done um, to be really a uh, modern academic pathology department. Um, 
the population of West Africa altogether is about 300 million. 200 million are Anglophone, and I think a significant proportion of them actually live in Nigeria. There are 200 total pathologists, so they are, um, what I said, one pathologist per million people. Um, and 80% of those pathologists are either in Nigeria or Gambia. And this compares, he used the Netherlands, uh, one pathologist per 35,000. And that's probably pretty much what it is in most of Europe. So infrastructure, they have outdated equipment, um, inadequate or unserviceable new equipment. And what happens is people meaning well send their old Cryostats, or send their old um, histotech machines, or cutting machines, or whatever. But if you don't have a service contract and you can't buy the consumables that are used by that particular product, it becomes a graveyard. And Julia can probably tell you about the graveyard of uh, laboratory equipment that sits in McCary Hospital, electrolyte machines that there's no gas. So how can you run electrolytes on a gas? Um, so the intentions are good, but the serviceability of some of these gifts are less than um, adequate. Public-private partnerships are very rare in most African countries. Um, I like uh, Yawali's term, epileptic electricity and water supply, because it is. I spent um, a Fulbright in McCary in the month of January of 2009 I had internet and electricity for four days in the entire month. So um, it's, it's a very difficult situation to work in. The unfortunate thing, and this is sort of, now that I have a gold medal, I, can, I have a soapbox to stand on. Um, three different research units in the same building as the pathology department have generators. But they are not used in the patient care services. They are only used in the research laboratory. And I will leave it at that. Um, there are not enough private labs available in some countries like South Africa there are, and there's an inadequate supply of reagents. And I think USAID has spent millions of dollars looking at supply chain, um, public-private partnerships. I think that in pathology we should borrow some of that knowledge and use it to uh, develop better supply chains for reagents, not just in histology, but in uh, labs and medical services in general. Training services, there are very few training institutes, and these are the National, National Professional Medical College of Nigeria, the West African Professional Medical College, and the Ghanaian College of Physicians and Surgeons. And those four, uh, three large uh, colleges, which is all of Nigeria and Ghana, produces less than 50 pathologists per year. And Ken Fleming at the Royal College figured out that at the current level of training and exodus of current staff, it would take several hundred years to get to even one pathologist per 100,000 people in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, there's a long way to go in training. Um, there's lack of molecular uh, PCR. Some of this is done as research supporting um, funded programs in Africa, but for the general patient to have access to a molecular diagnosis or FISH or IHC is very rare in academic institutions in Africa. Um, there's not good QC or quality assurance. There's a lack of integrated laboratory systems, and the fact that the medical record in the hospital would be linked to the pathology department is almost doesn't occur, except in South Africa and places like that. In fact, I asked um, Nelson Sewon Combo, who is the principal at McCary, I said, well, all these past reports are done in somebody's private lab down the street or this place or that place or for a research project, how often are they actually placed in the patient's medical record? And he said, I don't know, but it's probably not even 50%. So that's a big problem. If you're going to treat patients, you have to have access 
to the report and not what somebody wrote in a chart that how they interpreted the report. Um, telepathology is there in a few places and does help where it's available, but um, because of Internet Act problems, um, it can't be relied on for um, in-time diagnosis. Okay, now we'll move to East Africa. Um, the president is Eda Vukahula, and she is chair of pathology at Moon Billy Hospital. And you can see East Africa has a few more countries um, who are um, active members of oops, active members of the East Africa division. Um, these are most of the countries: Kenya, Malawi, South Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia. Sudan actually participates in the Arab division of the IAP because they're part of um, uh, Arab Africa. So in Kenya, they have quite a few pathologists, more than 10. They probably have closer to 40 or 50 between the different hospitals, both private and public. Um, they have a few more cytotechnologists because Kenya actually has a cytotechnology training program and a cytopathology training program, as well as a small histotechnology. There are some good oncologists. In fact, um, Walter, I can't remember how to say his last, huh? Mavana is a pediatric oncologist who is also a pathologist and now chair of the department. So there is good coordination between oncology and pathology now at Nairobi. Uh, Malawi has fewer pathologists, um, really only one cytotech and one histotech. But what they have set up through the MEPI is a, uh, telemedicine, telepathology with North, University of North Carolina. So they have a pathologist on site who collaborates with um, UNC for consultations on difficult cases and also for quality assurance. So that is one place. Um, telepathology is providing an important service. South Sudan has two pathologists. Um, one spends most of his time doing Ministry of Health things, uh, public health, forensics, a lot of, so where you have very few pathologists, most of them have 10 or 15 different jobs, so they're not fully dedicated to doing diagnostic pathology. They have no cytotechs, no histotechs, no oncologists, no chemo, and no radiation. So they're very, um, a young country, but with poorly resourced um, in terms of cancer care and diagnosis. Tanzania has a lot more pathologists, but their main problem is, is they don't have residents, so they don't have new people coming into pathology. They have a few cytotechs. Um, they were trained in Kenya, but they do have a good histotechnology school. They teach immunohistochemistry. They have some resources available for training. Um, Uganda has a lot of pathologists, but um, they sort of are a lot of cats. They don't uh, herd together very well. And a lot of them, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, have independent research projects going on. Zambia has a very few pathologists. Two of them are forensic in the military. Um, they are getting two cytotechnologists trained and histotechs, and they do have, they are ramping up their cancer uh, diagnosis prevention and care in that country, especially in cervical cancer. Um, so the challenge is identified by Dr. Vuhahula is obviously there's an acute shortage. Um, as I said, Pathology residency is not very popular in medical graduates. They want to specialize in things where they can make extra money. Um, AIDS has been an area that has pulled a lot of the cream of the crop of physicians into um, HIV-related programs because they can earn a better salary, or they do surgery, or they do something where they have private practice outside of the hospital. So it's hard to get um, good pathologists. Some of the better pathologists they have do training in the UK or the US and they end up staying there. Um, 
so they lose people that way. Governments uh, do very little to support pathology. Um, the way it's set up in Uganda and Tanzania and several other places is the hospital is Ministry of Health. The pathology department is Ministry of Education. And so they say, the hospital says, the pathology department should pay for all the formal and in the containers and for all the supplies to do pathology. And the pathology department says, well, some of the costs should be shared by the hospital. So there's gaps in funding um, because of the uh, same thing that happens in this country. Different agencies are competing for the same dollars. So. Um, and pathologists have little control over any of the budget. They sort of are part of the trickle-down economy in healthcare in Africa. And they're not, even though they have a training program in Tanzania, they don't have, um, there are very few centers for people to become really good lab managers with histotechnology training. Um, other things, and most of these are challenges anywhere long turnaround time. I did a, a survey of some of the turnaround time. A Burkitt's lymphoma that was sent in from a distant hospital wasn't sent for two months and then took another month to get processed and turned around. So what happened to that child during that three month period? And then I don't know how long it took for the report to get back. So obviously it was sent, but it wasn't used for patient care. But even in the hospital, in McCary, if you have a surgery, they ask you to bring your container. And then if there's formalin around, they use the formalin. And then they give that bucket of formalin with the tissue in it back to the patient. And the patient decides if he wants to send it to Dr. O'Ware's lab or to the private lab because he has money or nowhere because he doesn't have money or he can bring it to the university and the university will process it for free. But um, unless you want immunohistochemistry or something, and then there's service added fees for that exceptional service. So um, I don't know how you can do cancer databases if diagnoses are being made in five or six different laboratories from one hospital. And again, does the, the report get back to the patient's chart? Um, the best turnaround time is obviously in small diagnostic biopsy services where the people doing the biopsies are motivated to get it to the path department, they follow up, they get the reports, and so the clinical demand for service improves the turnaround time. Um, there's lack of coordination. A friend of mine looked at clinical laboratories in Uganda. There are 954 clinical laboratories in Kampala. There are 15 at McCary University and Lago Hospital. Some of them work together and share resources. Most of them do not. So, and I know Uganda because I've worked there and have friends who've worked there. But I think this is true from discussions with most places. Um, patients are really not educated like we are here. They don't go on and learn about their diagnosis and ask questions and say, did you do this and do that. So. Um, the patients are often not very involved. They don't understand why having a tissue diagnosis result is important for their therapy and their prognosis. Um, there are a few initiatives towards accreditation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in future directions. Francophone Africa, I put this in here. Um, I was, we got very few responses from Francophone Africa, six from five countries, but you see most of the countries didn't respond even though we sent um, individual emails to people and the survey was in French. But um, the Frank, Francophone Africa sort of affiliates more with France than with U.S. Um, but my old professor of pathology from Kinshasa University, I spent five years there, uh, Professor Kalangai, who's now in Rwanda, agreed to come and talk about it and based on sort of things that he knew, presented some information. But um, I'm not going to really spend much time on Francophone Africa because of the lack of, um, they have fewer pathologists, they do have some specialists that have been trained in France. Uh, 
half of them have side attacks. About 70% actually have histotechs. The number of oncologists varies, but chemotherapy is available in most countries and radiation in at least half. So now we'll move to uh, Southern Africa. Martin Hale is the president of Southern Africa and was actually the chair of the meeting that took place in Cape Town. Um, they have a fairly strong and active IEP division. It's been around for more than 20 years. The others have been formed in the last five years, the other two Anglophones. Um, we had responses from Botswana, both from a university and a private lab, Lesotho, uh, South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Um, Madagascar is part of that group, but they, I did not get a response from Madagascar. So in Botswana, they have seven pathologists in these two institutions, and as I said, they have the best pathology coverage because they have the smallest population. They have actively trained cytotechs and histotechs. They have oncologists, and they do have access to both chemo and radiation therapy. Um, Botswana is someplace that's really trying to make it work. They're starting a medical school, um, and I've talked to a lot of people there, and they're very interested in working on having a center of pathology excellence in, in Botswana at some time. The Soto has quite a few pathologists. I'm doing something wrong here. Um, but they aren't as actively involved. Mozambique started out with very little, but they've have external support. But during the time that they were sort of isolated, they kept training pathologists in collaboration with Portugal. They've kept working. They actually have a fairly good pathology department given the lack of resources. Carla Carrillo is part of the MEPI program, and she's um, a very good collaborator and very motivated to improve pathology um, in Mozambique. Zimbabwe has a history of having had a wonderful pathology department, but because of the political situation, they struggle, but they still have um, a, a number of really well-qualified pathologists working there. South Africa obviously has the most, but what Dr. Hale likes to point out that although there are 170 pathologists in South Africa, more than 60% of those are in the private sector, and only those with funds can access those laboratories in the large um, national centers like Baraguanas and uh, Johannesburg, uh, Port Elizabeth, and Durban in the national hospital centers, the ratio is still like one to 500,000 pathologists per patient population. So it's better but not as good as in the private sector where it's probably closer to one for 100,000 population or less. They do have a lot of cytotechs and histotechs, oncologists, so it's much more like a Western um, uh, country in terms of access to care for cancer if you have the financial ability to pay. So what are some of the, Ken Fleming from um, the Royal College for this meeting put together what's being done currently in Africa by external funders whether the U.S., the U.K., the E.U., or some other um, funding agencies. There's a lot of short-term activity, external visitors, training fellowships for a month or up to two years, uh, telepathology, research funding, short courses on how to develop um, standard operating and quality assurance programs. Uh, there's some long-term training programs, the British School of Pathology, has several programs every year. They bring specialist lecturers that go travel around to all of the East African countries or provide scholarships for other people to come. Um, but what Ken uh, concluded is that the programs are patchy, minimal, uncoordinated, opportunistic, short-term, and untargeted. So, um, and that that's, this is his slide, so. I won't disagree with him, but. And we did a survey trying to find out who's doing what. You know, what are you doing? Who are you working with? What are your outcome measures? 
um, how long is the program going to go? And we got some responses on this. Um, MEPI is probably a, a very good model of trying to have uh, input from the donors as well as the recipients to develop programs that are relevant to the countries where they're being done. And we got responses from um, these people who are actually doing pathology programs. Malawi, Ethiopia, um, South Africa. There are a few others that actually have pathology as part of the MEPI. Uh, Mozambique is another one. Uh, the Italians and Lorenzo Liancini, who some of you know, is one of the key players in uh, this pathology of other frontiers. They work in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania. Um, these other countries listed here, the biggest programs are in the three East African countries. The British division of the IEP works in both East and South Africa. They do those schools of pathology where they have specialists go down and do short-term training. Friends of Africa and USCAP, um, some of you know Adesina Adekunle. He's the person who does this. They, they um, actually got raised $100,000 on bursaries for people to come to the IEP meeting in Cape Town. SET is trying to create a pathology uh, residency program in Zambia. The problem is they were going to staff it with pathologists from the UK, but the national health system says we don't have enough pathologists to pay them to work in Zambia. They need to be working in the UK. So there are um, challenges in all the areas. Duke has a longstanding program in Kilimanjaro and they got a D43 through Geraldina's group to train pathology residents from KCMC. They're training at McCary. They now have three um, that will they'll go back and work in, um, in Tanzania when they're finished. Uh, Leona Ayers has done a lot of work with HIV malignancy, the Sub-Saharan Africa lymphoma, and she, through a D43, set up an immunohistochemistry lab and does pathology training now in Nairobi. Um, UCSF also set up an IHC lab. Um, Jeff Martin was the uh, PI on this. They're also training. They took four pathologists from McCary to train them in dermatopathology in general for six weeks at um, UCSF. And Bob Kolabunders, who I actually worked with in Zaire many, 25 years ago, uh, has always been very interested in HIV pathology, and he has funded several large autopsy studies on HIV pathology at McCary. Um, so what are the future directions? How do we start to um, confront some of these challenges? And with talking to a lot of people, including Ted and John and people in Africa, there has to be sort of some overarching um, institution or organization or group of people that can coordinate some of this. So there's, you know, the, the 30,000 foot vision of how this can be done rather than having these um, patchwork things. And so one of the things that was decided at the IAP meeting in Cape Town was to form an African assembly of the IAP. To start with, it'll be Southern. East and West Africa, and that's going to be um, formalized at the USCAP meeting in March of this year, and um, John Flanagan and I are working with, we're going to have all three of the presidents of those divisions in Baltimore, and we're going to meet together to talk about ways, strategize about things that can be done. We will invite Francophone to join it, um, if they want to. Right now, they sort of work with the French Assembly. Um, and what we hope to do is provide a framework for each country to pr pr create a strategic plan. Sort of, this is the basic concept of what you need to have a first tier functional histopathology laboratory embedded in the university department that supports research. And um, different hospitals, like with the stepwise clinical laboratory accreditation, will be able to figure out what works for them. Um, this would create a lot of volunteer opportunities. 
as well as hopefully some funded positions of people who could be there um, working in departments to help improve those departments, um, getting people who have a research interest matched with the countries where they might be able to do something, do training, also matching equipment needs with what equipment can be used there, and then um, the outcome would be integration and collaboration to achieve maximal output with limited resources on the continent. Um, so, and, and this isn't meant as an insult to people, this is just stating things the way they are. NCI has money for extramural international programs, and they might put out a grant for lymphoma, for cervical cancer, for breast cancer. Those are awarded to different universities. Some universities may have more than one grant, and they may work in one or more countries. But what you don't see here is arrows going between people working in Uganda or Tanzania or Kenya so that there is cross-collaboration or sharing of resources between those. And what I would like to suggest is that we flip the paradigm, and this is not a new idea. I put Uganda there specifically because in the 1960s, the British set up a school of medicine, but they also had a very strong central department of pathology. It was sort of the, as Dr. Connor, my old mentor, says, it was sort of the, the foundation of medical training was the department of pathology. And also all research went through the department. So rather than A, B, and C having their own little things, somehow if through the new assembly or through other means we can create a strong department like they had in the days of Burkitt um, at Uganda or the other major universities, then universities would not be able to say, well, it doesn't work, we can't work with them. If we can somehow support pathology departments and academic centers to work in the service of patient care, research can be built on top of that, and I think it will be the most meaningful in the long run. And um, that is sort of the goal of most of the African pathologists as well. So thank you, and I'll happy to answer any questions.